Munnan and I am here to present robotics. So let's see the today's contents. Um, this is chapter number two uh, from the book of Siciliano. I'll be following. I'll be covering um, closed chain um, kinematics in today's lecture, and I'll follow uh, typical uh, manipulators kinematics, and then. I would discuss about joint space and operational space. Um, and uh, I'm leaving these two articles, kinematic calibration and reverse kinematics problems to the students. And if you get any problem in these two articles, please write me down. So let's continue. Mm, the above direct kinematics method based on the DH convention exploits the inherently recursive feature of an open chain manipulator. Um, nevertheless, uh, the method can be extended to the case of manipulators containing closed, chain, uh, closed chains according to the techniques illustrated. So uh, this one is, uh, let's consider that this one is, um, is, um, single link in the chain with two links, okay? So uh, with this method, we're gonna study the closed kinematics. So I'll consider a closed chain manipulator constituted by n plus one links. Because of the presence of a loop, the number of joints L must be greater than n. In particular, it can be understood that the number of closed loops is equal to L minus n, um, so which is equal to um, so it is uh, particularly because L are the joints and N are, um, um, there are the N links. So, and the number of closed loops uh, are equal to L minus N. With reference to figure 2.17, which is this one, link zero through I, link zero through I are connected successively through the first I joint as in an open kinematic chain then joint i plus one dash this is joint i plus one dash connects link i with link i plus one dash so this is i plus one dash while joint i plus double dash and i uh, uh, connects link i or with with link i plus i uh, one double dash the axis of joints i plus one dash and I plus one double dash are assumed to be aligned. Uh, although not represented in the figure, links I plus one dash and I plus one double dash are members of the closed kinematics chain. So um, we'll get this idea. So let's continue. Okay. In particular, link I plus one dash which is this one, is further connected to link i plus two dash. Okay, so consider like this, this is an all closed chain. So i plus one dash, i plus, okay, this is, it should be, okay, this is transformation from i, i plus one dash, and then i plus two dash, and i plus three dash, and so on. And in the same way, i plus one double dash, i plus two double dash, and so on so forth until link j via joint g likewise link i plus one double dash is further connected to link i plus two double dash we uh, via joint i plus two double dash and so forth until link k so um, link k and link j are connected while finally links j and k are connected together at joint j plus one uh, to from uh, to form a closed chain in general, J are not equal to K, so there's some little bit difference. In order to attach frames to the various links and apply DH convention, one closed kinematic chain is taken into account. The closed chain can be visually cut open, like uh, we did this here, okay, here, um, uh, at J plus 1, that is the joint between link J and K, okay. So um, this is the procedure, so let's continue. In this way, an equivalent tree structured open kinematic chain is obtained and thus link frames can be defined as in figure 2.18. 
since leg zero through i occur before the two branches so from here to here we move um, they are left out of the analysis for the same reason link j plus one through n length j, j plus one which is further next to this one um, through n are left out as well notice that frame i is to be chosen with axis j i aligned with axis of joint i plus one dash and i plus one double dash so it means that um, z i over here is defined is defined in such a way that i plus one dash and i plus one double dash are aligned okay it follows that the position and orientation of frame j with respect to frame i can be expressed by composing the homogeneous transformations as so here we are moving from frame j to frame i using q dash like this from uh, first from j to j minus 1 and then from j minus 1 to j minus 2 and blah blah so on and in the end uh, it would reach up to i plus 1 dash to i so in this way we would reach from frame j to frame i so uh, we would be covering one chain uh, so where q dash is q i plus 1 dash and so forth so this one is like that And likewise, the position and orientation of frame K with respect to frame I is given by this one. So we are moving from K to frame I like this, first from K to K minus 1, and then so for K minus 1 to K minus 2, and so forth from I plus 1 double dash to I. So in this way, we could reach uh, from frame K to frame I. Again, where Q double dash is equal to is uh, set of q i plus one double dash to q k okay um, now we can say that this is frame i so from it we are moving from frame i to frame j and from frame uh, and then from frame i to from frame k as well so uh, let's uh, go through it since links j and k are connected to each other through joint j plus 1, which is going, to be, is going to be between them, it is worth analyzing the mutual position and orientation between frames j and k as illustrated, as illustrated in figure 2.19. Notice that since links j and k are connected to form a closed chain, so this is making so axis zj and axis zk are aligned again uh, since links j and k are connected okay uh, to form a closed chain the axis zj and zk are aligned so these axes are going to be aligned therefore the following orientation constraint has to be imposed between frame j frames j and k so uh, if you are reaching from uh, is, 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 okay, the axis Z in if you are moving from J to I and axis K from K to I is going to be the same. Where the unit vectors of the two axes have been conveniently referred to frame I. Okay, if joint J plus one is prismatic. The angle theta g, j k between axes x j and x k is fixed. So, um, as you know, the prismatic joint in prismatic joint theta is fixed and uh, d is variable. Hence, in but let's consider this condition first. Hence, in addition to 2.55, the following constraint is obtained. 2.55 means this one. Okay. The z axis are going to be the same. So, another uh, uh, constraint is which is going to be imposed if uh, joint j plus i, if j plus 1 is prismatic, is this one. So, if you are moving from frame j to frame i and from frame k to frame i via, via q dash, um, first of all, from j to i via q dash. And from k to i by q double dash is going to equal to cos theta j of k. 
It is because Z, which is this one, is aligned with ZK. Mm -hmm. And um, there's going to be a difference in XJ and XK. So if you, uh, the, the, if you want to transform this one to this one, the theta JK is going to be the relation. So by, we can, by theta JK, we can map them. So y, yk and yj is just defining the right hand frame method and that's nothing more than that. So this, all, this constraint is also going to be imposed. Obviously there is no need to impose a similar constraint on axis yj and yk since that would be redundant. So if this constraint has also has been imposed, there is no need to impose any constraint on these ones. So you can also impose constraint on this one only, or this one only. Mm, so let's go to the next slide. Regarding the position constraint between frames J and K, so let's um, define ve vector P from J to I and vector P from K to I, respectively denote the positions of the origins of frame J and K. So this is going to be say PG to I and PK to I. So it points from uh, here to here. So the direction is towards K, direction is towards J. Um, by projecting on frame J the distance vector of the origin of frame K from from J, mm, the following constraint has to be imposed. This constraint uh, is uh, if you it is says that if if you multiply from I to J with mm, with this one, okay, uh, which is the vector from uh, J uh, from uh, pointing towards J from I and rotation if you multiply this rotation vector uh, with this vector which is pointing from frame I to K we are only gonna, going to get this D J K transform so it's, 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 it's this thing because this on the, the Z axis are aligned so these two frames are only far to each other in z direction so we're gonna get this so important thing to note is this one is this that our j i is equal to our i j transpose denote the orientation of frame i with respect to frame j okay if joint j plus one is revolute then d j k is, is a fixed offset along axis z j Hence, three equalities of 2.57 fully describe the position constraint. So, this one is going to be the fixed if it is a revolute joint. If, however, joint J plus 1 is prismatic, then DJK definitely varies. Consequently, the only first two equalities of 2.57 describe the position constraint that is this one okay so this is going to be this is going to be equal and this one is not going to be there um where you know that uh, this one is just a vector a unit um two vectors after transpose of this one okay so it's just simple you know that right unit vectors In summary, if joint J plus 1 is revolute, the constraints are first of all this one and Z axis is going to be aligned for revolute. Whereas if joint uh, J plus 1 is prismatic, the constraints are this one, this one, and this one. So instead of first two conditions are quite similar except DJK and for prismatic, there's going to be some additional uh, constraint. Which is going to be along x axis. Um, in either case, uh, there are six equalities that must be satisfied. Uh, those should be solved for reduced number of independent joint variables to be keenly chosen among the components of Q dash and Q double dash, which we have discussed. 
which, which characterize the degree of freedoms of the closed chain. They are the, uh, these are the natural candidates uh, to be the actuated joints, while the other joints in the chain, including the cut joints, are typically not actuated. So the joints we are going to um, uh, including the cut joints, which are um, uh, okay, uh, cut joints are typically not actuated, so they are just passive. Okay. Independent variables together with the remaining joint variables not involved in the above analysis constitute the joint vector Q that allows the direct kinematic equation to be computed as this one. So from, uh, from n to 0, we move from j to i, from n to j, from j to i, and then from i to 0, where the subsequent and where the se sequence of successive transformations after the closure of the chain has been conventionally resumed from j, from frame j. So, yeah, that's what it is. In general, there is no guarantee to solve the constraints in closed form unless the manipulator has a simple kinematic structure. So I must say that and accept that. In other words, for a given manipulator with a specific geometry, that is a planar structure, some of the above equalities must be dependent. So there must be these equalities must be dependent on some other factors. Hence, the number of independent equalities is less than six and it should likely be easier to solve them. Otherwise, it won't be easier to solve. So, um, to, um, to conclude, it is worth sketching the operating form of the procedure to compute the direct kinematic function for a closed chain cat manipulator using BH convention. Number one, in the closed chain, select one joint that is not actuated. Assume that the joint is cut open so as to obtain an open chain in tree structure. Compute the homogeneous transformations according to DH convention. Find the equality constraints for two frames connected by the cut joints. Okay. Solve the constraints for reduced number of joint variables. Express the homogeneous transformations in terms of the above joint variables and sorry this is a, not a six point and compute the direct kinematic function by composing the various transformation from the base frame to the end effector frame. Okay. Now I have I have made corrections. So please note that. Let's go next. Okay, so there is a little exercise about kinematics of typical manipulator. So it's going to be pretty easy. First, you move from this frame 0 to frame 1, from frame 1 to frame 2, and from frame 2 to frame 3. So there is only going to be in the direction of A, I, which is going to be this one. Okay, because Z is pointing um, out of the paper out of the board and um, we move along this so a1 is going to be uh, a, a, a is going to be a1 and then a2 and then a3 so it's going to be quite sim simple so i want to spend a lot of time on it okay so i would love to talk about this thing um, let's consider the parallelogram in figure uh, closed chain occurs where the first uh, where the first two joints connect link one uh, and link um, so uh, consider the parallelogram um, a closed chain occurs uh, where the first two joints connect link one dash so a link one dash and link one double dash to link zero. So this forms a closed chain. Joint four was selected as a cut joint. So we are going to cut this open. Um, and the link frames have been established according to accordingly. So um, 
gonna zoom out for you. So if you're gonna move from here to here and then here, you can simply say that a1 dash, a2 dash, a3 dash, which we discussed previously. So theta1 dash, theta2 dash, theta3 dash. So in the same way, a1 double dash, we're gonna reach from here, then it's gonna be theta1 double dash. Now about a4. So this one is simply a4 from here to here. We have moved from frame um, from frame one from a1, a2 to a3, from this frame 0 to 1, 2, and then 3, which is gonna be aligned with x1 double dash. And then from here to here, we're gonna move from 0 to uh, 1 double dash through this plane, which is this one. So we are going, we are having this theta 1 double dash as variable. So um, in A4, because um, it is simply a distance, and um, so um, since A1 and A3 and A2 and A1 are equal, A1 equals to A3 and A2 equals to 1, because we are having this parallelogram, A1, A3, A2, and A1. Um, this one I, I must say that okay. I have just made little corrections. So uh, since a1 dash is equal to a3 dash and a2 dash is equal to a11 dash, um, which is this thing, a1 equals to a3 dash, a2 dash is equal to a11 dash because this parallelogram. So um, two independent constraints can be extracted, which is this one. So a1 dash cos theta 1 plus uh, a1 dash cos theta 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is, okay, this is a1 dash cos theta 1, and then a1 dash um, cos theta 1 plus cos theta 2 dash plus cos theta 3 dash. So it's going to be uh, something like uh, this. So 1, 2, and 3, so it's going to be in something like this, from here to here. Theta 1 plus 2 and then plus 3. So we can get this one. So the point is, if you reach from cos theta 1 to here, a1, which is this one, if this is a1 cos theta 1, and if we come up with this, there's going to be some relation. And what is going to be, let's see it. Plus a1 uh, double dash uh, multiplied with cos theta 1 plus 2 minus cos theta 1 double dash, which is this one. So let me first, okay, let me choose pen, which is of this color. So this one is a1 double dash. This one is a1 double dash. So we are going to have a1, um, sorry. a1 double dash cos theta 1 plus 2 so it's going to be a1 double dash cos theta 1 plus 2 which is going to be this angle okay minus c1 double dash so we subtract it like this um, C1, which is cos theta 1 double dash, which is from here to here. So, if you're going to see the cause of this, this is going to be somewhere here. And if you're going to see the cos theta 1 dash, it's also going to be somewhere here. Because uh, um, this one is cos theta 1 double dash. So, again, it's going to be somewhere here. So if you both will be pointing in this direction, if we add them together, it's going to be zero. If we add them, this one, this one, and 
this one is going to be zero. So this is the constraint we are having, and so on for this equation as well. If you don't get how, if you don't understand how we get this equation, please comment below. I will explain. So in order to satisfy them for any choice of a1 dash and a1 double dash, it must be uh, this thing that um, this thing. So theta1 dash plus theta2 dash must be equal to theta1 double dash. Why? Because it is a parallelogram. You can see that. Because it is a parallelogram. Let me erase that. So theta 1 dash plus theta 2 dash must be equal to theta 1 double dash. So because it is a parallelogram, these equations, the, these relations must be satisfied. And in the same way, theta 3 dash plus theta 2 dash must be equal to pi, which is, um, yeah, theta 1 dash plus theta 2. This is less. Theta 3 dash plus theta 2 dash. So this one is theta 3, this one is theta 3 plus theta plus theta 2, theta 3 plus theta 2. If you're going to get add them together, definitely it's going to be on the line. So the angle on the overall would be a pi. Therefore, the vector of joint variable is q is equal to theta 1 and theta 2 double dash because rest of the angles we can express them as a function of these two independent variables so you know though you know that if you want to describe theta 3 dash for example if you know theta mm, okay i'm sorry wait a minute um and there was a little mistake. Um, the, therefore, the, actually, this was the mistake. Um, the joint variables is Q, and it is in the set of theta 1 dash and theta 1 double dash. So we only need these two variables to describe the whole geometry, whole kinematics. And that's what it is. It's going to be the simple and easy. For example, if you want to describe theta 2 dash, you can, you can different, you can, if you have theta 1 dash, you can find out this from this relation. And if you have theta 2 dash, you can also calculate theta 3 dash. So that's going to be the geometry. So if you want to reach from frame 4 to frame 0, you're going to reach from frame 4 to frame 3, then 3 dash to 0. And that's how we're going to compute this. Um, a comparison between 2.64, this one, and 2.49 reveals that the parallelogram arm is kinematically equivalent to a two-link planar arm. If you see that, if you see that kinematically, they are both equal. And the noticeable difference, though, is that the two actuated joints, providing the degree of freedom of the structure, are located at the base. This will greatly simplify the dynamic model of the structure as will be seen later. So uh, if we want to simplify the dynamics, you want to increase, enhance its different properties. You, if, you if you design closed kinematic chain, it would make things a lot easier. And many of the researchers try developing different kinds of kinematic chain for different kinds of, for different purposes. And there, and in the sense of um, um, actuation and uh, other things, um, in the sense of uh, kinematic kinematics, the two things are equal. Like the two link are planar arm and this one, uh, so it makes things quite interesting. So if you want to research in this on this topic, like how to define a closed kinematic chain having specific degree of freedom, you can make things a lot, uh, you can make things a lot easier and interesting. So um, 
Again, this is this is the DL parameter for a DLR manipulator. It's very simple. I won't describe it now. I won't discuss it in detail. In on the only thing is that um, this one is theta zero, and um, you can see this one is t z z zero, and this one is z one. So because it's going to be it's it is moving from here to here. So it's the, 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 the angle is pi by 2 because from z0 to z1 and then from z1 it is again moved to z2 so the again angle is z2 because the angles are joints are revolute so theta our thetas are variables and uh, when uh, we have moved from z1 to z2 and from z2 to z3 um, and um, because there is d3 in between z3 uh, here and z2 here and z3 here so although we have theta 3 we would also have d3 and then again from z3 and we move on to z4 uh, so again the angle is going to be pi by 2 um, and then uh, from this one where we are here from z4 to z5 z4 to this one is going to be z5 so again first of all the angle is going to be pi by 2 and because here d5 is involved which is this one uh, it's going to be the part of d5 over here and so forth so uh, i think this is pretty simple if you don't get it uh, i'd like to explain but um, please uh, spend some time in understanding and if you don't understand it please read the text and um, I won't be describing any further. So I leave the sort of things to you guys. Um, um, I hope you would get it. If you don't get it, please write me, I'll explain. But you also supposed to do these kinds of exercises on your own. Mm, with reference to the operational space, so let, let me talk about uh, operational space and joint space now. Uh, with reference to the operational space, and in, uh, an index of robot performance is the so-called workspace. This is the region described by the origin of the end factor frame when all the manipulator joints execute all possible motions. So that's what it is. And uh, what is workspace? Uh, with reference to the operational space and index of robot performance is the so-called workspace. Uh, again, I have said it one more time. Uh, this is the region described by the origin of the end factor frame for all manipulated joints execute all possible motions. Uh, oh, sorry, please repeat it. It is um, okay. It is often customary to distinguish between reachable workspace and exterior workspace. Mm, the dexterous workspace is the region. Sorry. The dexterous workspace is the region described by the origin of the end factor frame and all the manipulator joints execute um, all possible motions. It is often okay. It is of. It is often um, customary to distinguish between reachable workspace and the dexterous workspace. Um, the, 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 the dexterous workspace is the region that the region of the anti-factor frames can describe while attaining different orientations, while the former is the region that the region of the anti-factor frame. So for example, the, this is the link 1, this is the link 2, and this is link 3, and then there is an anti-factor. So you can reach in this point is in this way and in this way as well right and in the same other way so this is called uh, dexterous workspace so this one is going to be is dexterous workspace so um so this is going to be a dexterous workspace Obviously, uh, this dexterous workspace is going to be the subspace of reachable workspace. So, if this is a reachable, so for example, if this one is a reachable workspace, so this is going to be its dexterous workspace. So, it can reach from here with many combinations, with two combinations. So, it's just, um, 
Okay, a manipulator with less than six degree of freedom cannot take an arbitrary position and orientation. So this is again uh, one comment on it. And then we discuss something about kinematic redundancy. But let me first remove it. Uh, a manipulator is termed uh, kinematically redundant when it has number of degree of freedom which is uh, greater than the number of variables that are necessary to describe the given task. So for example, if you want to um, move in six degree of freedom, and uh, you have um, um, and six degree of freedom, you can describe everything in the space. But if you uh, have, let's say, 12 degrees of freedom, then the six degree of freedoms are redundant. Um, a manipulator is, intrinsic, uh, is intrinsically redundant when the dimension of the operational space Okay, dimension of the operational space is smaller than the dimension of the joint space. So, for example, if you're moving in three dimension and there is a joint space which is m dimension, so you are having a redundancy. Why to intentionally utilize a redundant manipulator? Um, the answer is to recognize that redundancy can provide the manipulator with dexterity and versatility in its motion. The typical example is constituted by a human arm that has seven degree of freedom three in shoulder, one in the elbow, and three in the wrist without considering the degree, without considering of the degree of freedoms in the finger. The manipulator is intrinsically redundant. In fact, if the base and the hand position and orientation are both fixed, uh, requiring six degree of freedoms, the elbow can be moved, and uh, it's only possible because of its additional degree of freedom. Then, for instance, it is obviously it is possible to avoid obstacles in the workspace. So it is used to avoid workspace in the in, in the region. Further, if a joint of a redundant manipulator reaches its mechanical limit, there must there might be other joint that allow execution of the prescribed and effector motion. So um, these redundant uh, variables allow versatility and dexterity. So with this, I conclude my presentation. If you have any comment, um, please let me know. If you think that my presentation style can be improved, I would love to do it um, uh, with your input. Uh, I would end my presentation with three great professors. Uh, Usama Khate from Stanford University, uh, Bruno Siciliano, uh, this, the, the author of the book we are following, and Professor Vidya Sagar, um, he is also a great roboticist. So thank you very much and uh, see you in my next video.